Good evening. Our second night of the mission for our patronal feast will unfold exactly the same as last night. So, the same process to talk, and then afterwards, adoration with the litany of the Holy Cross and then benediction. Just one announcement you may have seen the parish email that went out today. The schedule for the week, there's a mistake. There's, we don't have adoration and Mass on Friday, already the parish mission this week, so yesterday, today, tomorrow at 7 p.m. will be the Mass for the Patronal Feast. There's no adoration or in Mass on Friday. That was a mistake in the board. So then we'll begin this evening. Please stand. We'll begin with a reading from the Gospel. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but... Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Praised be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Our mission theme, Jesus the Christ and the Cross, invites us to look at the identity of Jesus, the mission to which he was, with which rather he was entrusted, and in fact, the mission which he accomplishes. In that passage, well known to us from Matthew 16, we have just in a few lines quite a number of references to Jesus by name as Jesus. He speaks of himself as the Son of Man. Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And finally, Jesus answers that it's his Father who reveals this. Last night, we looked at what is meant by a certain breath, by the name Jesus, who it refers to, that in fact, in the name of Jesus, we are on a first-name basis with God. Jesus Christ. What then do we mean by Jesus Christ? What does Christ add to just Jesus? What do we mean by that? We might, at first glance, think that Christ is like a surname. So Jesus is the first name, Christ is the surname. And that's not the case. But there's a certain analogy in which we might help us understand. Because our family names, our surnames, many of them have an origin in a kind of profession or work that's done. 
We'll think of a tailor, tanner, baker, very common names. Maybe the most common name in English, in this part of the world, Smith. All refer to kind of professions, and probably at one point, the given name, the first name, was just complemented by the profession. John the blacksmith, or John the tanner, or John the tailor, and then eventually it became a family name, a surname. And so there's something like that in Jesus Christ. Christ gives us the work that Jesus does. Not exactly the same, but there's something about that that is analogously true. Let's look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 436, because it gives us the actual definition of Christ and why we use that word. The Catechism says, the word Christ comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed. So Christ is the word for Messiah. Same word, Greek instead of Hebrew. And it means anointed. You recall a baptism or a confirmation or an ordination, the oil that is used to anoint the newly baptized or the one to be con or the one being confirmed or the one just ordained is called chrism. Chrism oil, the oil of anointing. So the word Christ comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed. It became the name proper to Jesus only because he accomplished perfectly the divine mission that Christ signifies. Then the Catechism goes on to explain the history of the term. In effect, in Israel, those consecrated to God for a mission that he gave were anointed in his name. This was the case for kings, for priests, and in rare instances, for prophets. So there's a history throughout the Old Testament that those who had special missions were anointed with oil for those missions, and anointed mostly kings and priests. The Catechism continues, this had to be the case all the more so for the Messiah whom God would send to inaugurate his kingdom definitively. It was necessary that the Messiah be anointed by the Spirit of the Lord at once as king and priest and also as prophet. Jesus fulfilled the messianic hope of Israel in his threefold office of priest, prophet, and king. So Jesus Christ says something about who Jesus is. We looked at that in some detail last night. Jesus is that person, the divine person who has a human nature and a divine nature. And Christ is the mission. Jesus Christ, we speak about the identity and the mission. We have to be careful. We're not dividing Jesus against himself, much less saying that there's a Jesus who is human and then a divine Jesus who has a mission. No, none of that. Jesus is one person, divine person, the eternal son of the Father, who has a divine nature and a human nature. We looked at last night in the mystery of the Incarnation. But this person has a mission. 
And to fulfill that mission, the mission of the Messiah, he's anointed. So there's not two subjects, one subject, Jesus Christ. But when we say Jesus Christ, we speak of a person and a mission. This was foreshadowed in the Old Testament by priests and kings, especially who had missions and therefore were consecrated and anointed for that mission. We saw that very dramatically in May at the coronation of King Charles III. The key moment, he was anointed with holy oil. The choir sang, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. The words of the anointing of King Solomon applied. But because we know that history, we might first ask, when was Jesus anointed? When was the oil of anointing poured out upon him? Well, we won't find that, will we? But that's because the anointing of the kings and priests the oil itself did not confer in its substance any consecration. It was what the oil represented. In the case of Jesus, he doesn't need the oil of anointing because his anointing comes from the Holy Spirit. He is already anointed. We might say that at the Incarnation, the Son, Eternal Son, takes to himself a human nature in Jesus and is anointed by the Father with the Holy Spirit. You might say something like that. And so Jesus is anointed from the first moment of his existence by the Holy Spirit. Consider some key moments from the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. At the Annunciation itself, the Archangel Gabriel says to the Blessed Virgin Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit will overshadow you. From the first moment of Jesus' existence in the womb of the Blessed Mother, the Holy Spirit is already present. The conception of that child was for a mission of which the Archangel Gabriel also spoke. What this son of hers would do by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the dream of Joseph, that's confirmed. What has taken place in Mary has taken place by the Holy Spirit. When the child is born in Bethlehem, the angels proclaim to the shepherds, For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Very interesting. They don't say there in Bethlehem is born Jesus. They use other titles, the Savior. That's the mission. And who is going to complete the mission? The anointed one, the Messiah. And who exactly is this anointed one or the Messiah? God himself, the Lord. So Jesus is introduced to the world, we might say, the name of his title, his mission, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. 
And then look at the public life of Jesus where the mission is accomplished, where he begins to preach the kingdom, to teach and to heal, and eventually to go to the cross and to offer his life for our redemption. But the beginning of the public life is all about the anointing. The anointing by the Spirit. We mustn't think that God sends his Son into the world, the Son does his work, the Son returns to the Father, and only then does the Spirit come. We, it's easy enough to think that way because we think in terms of the resurrection, the ascension, and then Pentecost. And Jesus says, when I return to the Father, I will send my Holy Spirit, which he does at Pentecost. But the Spirit has already been present in the mission of the Lord Jesus. And so at the beginning of the public life of Jesus, the baptism the Jordan by John the Baptist. The heavens open and the Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. It's a kind of anointing in the same way we anoint children after they're baptized. And then we're told, mysteriously, the Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness. Where for 40 days and 40 nights he fasts in preparation for his public mission. And at the end of it, he's tempted by the devil. Tempted precisely to avoid his mission. To take a different path. But it's the spirit who led him out into the desert. Drove him out, in fact, the scripture says. The spirit, the anointing of the spirit remains with him. He triumphs over the temptation. And then very important, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes back to Nazareth. Back to the place where the Holy Spirit overshadowed his blessed mother. And in the synagogue... He takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he reads from the scroll, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to do what? Proclaim liberty to captives, the good news to the poor, the year of the Lord's favor. In the synagogue at Nazareth, at the beginning of his public life, Jesus links the prophecy of Isaiah, the anointing by the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, with his mission. And recall the response. The people are not happy about it. They say, we know who this is. This is Jesus. We saw him grow up here. He worked in Joseph's shop. He lived with Mary and Joseph. We know, we know who he is. And they actually turn violently against him. Why? Because he says in not so many words, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the one whom the Spirit of the Lord has anointed. And so we see there what happens when we accept Jesus but reject the Christ. That's really what the people of Nazareth did. It's understandable enough because they knew Jesus so well, they thought he couldn't be the Christ. But in fact, he was. He was from the moment of his conception in Nazareth. He was when the angels told the shepherds that this is the Christ who has been born. 
He declares it by his own authority in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good, the good news to the poor. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In the baptism and in the temptations and in the synagogue at Nazareth, it is emphasized again and again and again. The Holy Spirit rests on this one. This Jesus is not only Jesus, God and man, but this Jesus, this Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, anointed by God for the completion of the mission of redemption and salvation. And so it is that Throughout the Gospels, you have different names used for Jesus. Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, Lord, Teacher, Rabbi. But at that climactic moment in Matthew 16, when Jesus puts to the apostles the question, Who do you say that I am? They have been with him now three years. It's almost as if Jesus is saying to the apostles, those people I lived with for 30 years in Nazareth, they knew that I'm Jesus from the house of Joseph and Mary but do you know who I really am? And Peter gives a beautiful response, a response that we can make a prayer, a simple but profound prayer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus affirms Peter's confession of faith precisely by telling Peter, this is not something you could have known on your own. My anointing in the Holy Spirit, the fact that I am the Christ, the Messiah, is something that only the Father could have revealed to you. But he did reveal it. And Jesus, having been confessed as Christ by Peter, confirming that confession, promising that upon Peter his church would be built, is then confronted by the very same Peter who rejects the mission of the redemption. God forbid it that you should go to Jerusalem and be crucified. Peter, just after saying you are the Christ, rejects the mission of the Christ. As we know, Jesus rebukes him for that harshly. So Christ is the mission for which Jesus is anointed. Note then that when it comes time for the crucifixion, for Christ crucified, which we will look at tomorrow evening. The title put over the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Well, Jesus of Nazareth is how he was known. King of the Jews was the charge against him. He had made himself a rival of Caesar. But notice the word Christ doesn't appear there. How could it? If they called him the Christ, they certainly could not have crucified him. He was the Messiah, the holy 
anointed one of God. If they had recognized him as the Christ, there could not have been a crucifixion. But the mission of the Christ was the redemption on the cross. We pay careful attention to the words of the liturgy, prayers at Holy Mass, which are chosen with great care, no accidental cobbling together there. Some of those prayers are 1,500 years old or, long, or older. We find something very interesting. is that the prayers of the Mass refer almost exclusively to Jesus Christ or Christ the Lord. Christ is given the priority. It's very rare, aside from the Gospel readings, the Scripture readings, that the word Jesus is used without Christ. Sometimes we find Christ used without Jesus. At Holy Communion, we hear the priest say, the body of Christ. Interesting. We often talk about the Eucharist and say, there's the real presence of Jesus. Absolutely true. And if we were to say the body of Jesus, that would not be wrong. We don't say that. We say the body of Christ. Why? Because it's the mission of Christ, offering himself to the Father on the cross and offering himself to us in Holy Communion that explains what's going on. It's not that Jesus came, the Son of God as man, but that Jesus came, the Son of God as man, and came for our redemption and offered us the gift of salvation. The work of redemption is the mission carried out in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. For the body of Christ. Again, not to divide Jesus against the Christ or to separate Christ from Jesus, not at all. But Christ gives us something in addition, something essential, and might we say even more important. What is more important, Jesus or Christ? That's not a good question, because it tends to lead us to separate the two. But what we might say is that Christ is more complete because it contains Jesus. The mission doesn't exist separate from the person accomplishing it. We could imagine, for example, a person without a mission. We do it all the time. When we meet someone, we say, what do you do? I've just met you. What's your mission? What's your profession? What is it that you do? But the mission can never exist without someone who's accomplishing it. And so we might say that without any division or separation between the two, that Christ has a kind of primacy in the liturgy, in the catechism, and even in the scriptures. For today is born for you a Savior, Christ the Lord. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
There's a certain priority because Christ, the anointed Messiah, is the one who carries out the public life, the, my the mystery of redemption. Christ includes Jesus because only Jesus, as the God-man, could fulfill the mission that God the Father sent him to accomplish in the Spirit. So Jesus Christ is more complete. Or Jesus Christ even more complete. But in a certain sense, Christ includes Jesus. So we speak about the mystery of Christ. And we call ourselves Christians. We don't call ourselves whatever the equivalent would be if we used the word Jesus. Hindu ones or something like that. It would be it would not be unusual like Buddhists or Confucians to Call ourselves after Jesus. But from the earliest days, Christians. Because we want to identify the mission that includes Jesus, that could only have been done by Jesus, but also because we would like to be anointed. We, in fact, are anointed. We desire to share in the mission. You and I have no, absolutely no possibility of being Jesus. Jesus is one specific, highly specific person in history. I cannot be Jesus because, first of all, I'm not God and I'm not God incarnate. But I can't even be the same person my brother is. We're different. But we can participate in the same mission. And in fact, we are anointed. Anointed at baptism, anointed at confirmation. We are anointed to participate in the same mission of Jesus on the cross for the redemption of the world. Only he can do it. Only he has done it. But when he unites himself to us in the sacraments, above all, in the Holy Eucharist, then we can participate in that mission. There's a term used for the work of a priest, alter Christus, another Christ, specifically for the work at the altar. Not another Jesus, only one Jesus but another Christ who participates in the same mission, another expression for the priest's work in the person of Christ. That applies specifically to the sacraments, but it applies more broadly to all the baptized, to be other Christs. What does it mean when Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me? He says, I am Jesus, anointed I am the Messiah whose mission is to carry the cross, to go to the cross, and you can participate in that. And so we call ourselves Christians after the Christ. We began last night with St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, second chapter. We conclude there this evening, so that at Jesus' name, every knee must bend in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
of the eternal covenant in this most wonderful sacrament your son jesus christ has left us the memorial of his passion deepen our reverence for the mystery of his body and blood that we may experience within us the fruit of his redemption we ask this through our lord jesus christ your son who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit god forever and ever Amen. The Litany of the Holy Cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, our Advocate, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Cross, where the Lamb of God was offered, save us, O Holy Cross. Hope of Christians, save us, O Holy Cross. Pledge of the resurrection of the dead. Save, Save us, us, O Holy, Holy Cross. cross. Shelter of persecuted innocents. Save, Save us, O Holy, Holy cross. cross. Guide for the blind. Save, Save us, O Holy, Holy cross. cross. Way for those who have gone astray. Save, Save us, O Holy, Holy cross. cross. Staff of the lame. Save, Save us, O Holy, Holy cross. cross. Consolation of the poor. Save, Save us, O Holy, Holy cross. cross. Restraint of the powerful. Save us, O Holy Cross. Destruction of the proud. Save us, O Holy Cross. Refuge of sinners. Save us, O Holy Cross. Trophy of victory over hell. Save us, O Holy Cross. Terror of demons. Save us, O Holy Cross. Sure guide of youth. Save us, O Holy Cross. Succor of the distressed. Save us, O Holy Cross. Hope of the hopeless. Save us, O Holy Cross. Star of the Mariner. Save us, O Holy Cross. Harbor of the Shipwrecked. Save us, O Holy Cross. Rampart of the Besieged. Save us, O Holy Cross. Father of Orphans. Save us, O Holy Cross. Defense of Widows. Save us, O Holy Cross. Council of the Just. Save us, O Holy Cross. Judge of the Wicked. Save us, O Holy Cross. Rest of the afflicted. Save us, O Holy Cross. Safeguard of childhood. Save us, O Holy Cross. Strength of manhood. Save us, O Holy Cross. Last hope of the aged. Save us, O Holy Cross. Light of those who sit in darkness. Save us, O Holy Cross. Splendor of kings. Save us, O Holy Cross. Civilizer of the world. Save, Save us, O Holy, Holy Cross. Cross. Wisdom of the foolish. Save us, O Holy Cross. Liberty of slaves. Save us, O Holy Cross. Knowledge of the ignorant. Save us, O Holy Cross. Sure rule of life. Save us, O Holy Cross. Shield impenetrable. 
Save us, O Holy Cross. Heralded by prophets. Save us, O Holy Cross. Preached by apostles. Save us, O Holy Cross. Glory of martyrs. Save us, O Holy Cross. Study of hermits. Save us, O Holy Cross. Chastity of virgins. Save us, O Holy Cross. Joy of priests. Save us, O Holy Cross. Foundation of the Church. Save us, O Holy Cross. Salvation of the world. Save us, O Holy Cross. Destruction of idolatry. Save us, O Holy Cross. Support of the weak. Save us, O Holy Cross. Medicine of the sick. Save us, O Holy Cross. Cleansing of the leprous. Save us, O Holy Cross. Strength of the paralytic. Save us, O Holy Cross. Bread of the hungry. Save us, O Holy Cross. Fountain of those who thirst. Save us, O Holy Cross. Clothing of the naked. Save us, O Holy Cross. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee. Because by thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. Behold the cross of the Lord. Be gone, you evil powers. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Alleluia. O God, who for the redemption of the world was pleased to be born in a stable and to die upon a cross. O Lord Jesus Christ, by thy holy sufferings, which we, thy unworthy servants, call to mind. By thy holy cross and by thy death, deliver us from the pains of hell and vouchsafe to conduct us whither thou didst conduct the good thief who was crucified with thee, who lives and reigns eternally in heaven. Sweet the wood, sweet the nails, sweet the burden which thou bearest, for thou alone, O holy cross, was worthy to bear the King and Lord of heaven. Amen.
given them bread from heaven the bread which is full of all goodness let us pray Lord Jesus Christ who gave you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death may our worship of this sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit God forever and ever amen Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her glory. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. 
Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. Blessed, Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints.